Hey everyone! You should be in chapter 15. Nick wants to say hi. No. Bye. Bye. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and get started. This is chapter 15. Remember, you should have already done an outline of chapter 15 for sections 1 through, what, 4? I think. Yeah. For sections 1 through 4. So I don't even want you to listen to this podcast until you have done your outline. None of the stuff that I'm going to show you is going to make sense unless you have done that. Because remember what I said, I'm going to go more in depth on these podcasts from here on out. Alright? So here we go. Alright, first of all, equilibrium. What is it? It's really not that hard to understand. An equilibrium is basically a reaction that can proceed from reactants to products and from products to reactants. So they kind of start you off with this example of dinitrogen tetraoxide forming nitrogen dioxide gas. And it just so happens that this is a really nice reaction to demonstrate because you start with something colorless and you get a color being formed. Uh, don't get too excited because I'm not making this gas. It's uh, pretty toxic and uh, very, very, very like nauseous. Like makes you, makes your tummy sick. So anyway, it says at some time the color stops changing. So in other words, it'll fluctuate and go back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, and then all of a sudden, bam! It'll just be a consistent color, and we will have no more color changing, no more reaction occurring. When that happens, guys, we say that a chemical equilibrium has been established. When you no longer see any fluctuation between the reactants to the products and the products to the reactants, that's chemical equilibrium. It's not that the chemical reaction has completely stopped. It just means that the forward reaction is equal to the backwards reaction. In other words, like for every time you make a product, one of the products is making a reactant. So you've got to think of this reaction as happening in both directions, forward and backward. Okay. So the whole concept of this equilibrium is, means that the point at which the rate of decomposition equals the rate of, well, they say that dimerization, but basically the forward is equal to the backward. It's dynamic. So it says the equilibrium is dynamic because the reaction has not technically stopped. It just means that the opposing rates are perfectly in balance. The rate of the reaction going forward is equal to the rate re occurring backwards. That is technically what we call a dynamic equilibrium, an equilibrium that has reached its end point. So what does that look like? All right, take this for consideration. This is on page 629. So go there in your textbooks. All right, this is the um, N2O4 decomposing into that NO2 gas. So you got a colorless gas that's forming this brown stuff. Notice here on the left that this particular picture is all N2O4 and no NO2 is in there. And then if you go to the opposite side over here on the far right hand side, you see that this guy right here, it looks pretty brown. That's because it's formed nitrogen dioxide gas. So I'm going to read a couple of the captions here. So it says frozen N2O4 is nearly colorless. That means that basically it has um, uh, no NO2 in there. And it says, in the second frame, it says, as N2O4 is warmed above its boiling point, it starts to disassociate into brown NO2 gas. Now, notice here in the third frame, you look at the time clock up here, so time is definitely passed a little bit more than the first and second frames. It says, eventually, the color stops changing. Why does that happen? Well, it says that N2O4 and... NO2 have reached something called an equilibrium. And you'll notice that the arrows down here, you have an arrow going forwards and then you also have, it's kind of like a half arrow going forward and a half arrow going backwards. That means that the two gases have reached an equilibrium. The rate at which it goes from reactants to products and products to reactants is the same. It's balanced out. That's an equilibrium. All right. It says, at equilibrium, as much N2O2 forms to form NO2 and o NO2 reacts to reform. Blah, 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 blah. Sorry, just basically look at the 
double arrow. Anytime you see a double arrow occurring, that means that the reaction can go both from products to reactants and reactants to products. In other words, it's dynamic. So let's pretend that we're talking about rate laws. You guys should not be confused about rate laws. Remember what I told you, in an equilibrium, the rate forward equals the rate backwards. So look at this. We have a very simple example. If A turns into B, then the rate of the forward would depend upon the reactant A, how much reactant A you've got. For the reverse reaction, B turning to A, the rate would only be determined by the concentration of B this time. And so at equilibrium, it means that the rate going forward is equal to the rate going backwards. I don't know how many times I have to say that in this PowerPoint, sorry. But let's look at something a little different. Right here, we have two different pictures. This is on the bottom of page 629, in case you're interested. All right, so for this first one on the left, it's labeled as A. It says the concentration of dinitrogen texture oxide decreases while the concentration of NO2 increases. That's because as the reactant is used up, the product is formed. It says equilibrium is indicated when the concentrations no longer change versus time. So as you can see at this point right here, where the line is drawn, the concentrations remain the same. That is the equilibrium point. Let's go over here to part B. Part B says the rate of disappearance of dinitrogen tetraoxide decreases with time as the concentration of N2O4 decreases. That makes sense. So now we're talking about, on the left we're talking about concentration, on the right we're talking about the rate. Remember, once they each reach equilibrium, their rate should be exactly the same. That's when equilibrium has been established. But until they reach that point, their rate values, one will increase because it's being formed. One will decrease because it's going away. Reactant to product. All right. This is an interesting, cool little um, side note. And I've heard that they talk a lot about this process on the AP exams. So I definitely just wanted to kind of show you this particular example here. It says, consider the Halber process above. You've got nitrogen combining with hydrogen gas to form ammonia. Now, ammonia may not seem like a very important um, compound. Sorry, you're going to have to ignore the bells. Anyway, it may not seem like a very important um, compound to you, but the use of ammonia is very important for different aspects of agriculture and, believe it or not, for ballistics and um, explosives. So um, it says, if we start with a mixture of nitrogen and hydrogen in any proportion, the reaction will reach equilibrium with a constant concentration of nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia. It says, however, if we start with just ammonia and no nitrogen or hydrogen, guess what it'll naturally do on its own? the reaction will proceed from pure ammonia into nitrogen and hydrogen all by itself. The nitrogen and hydrogen will produce itself until an equilibrium is established. That's why we never keep pure ammonia in the lab. It will decompose naturally by itself into nitrogen and hydrogen gas. Um, all right, so let me just show you this real quick. So notice here, that there's no ammonia at all initially. These are partial pressures, by the way, because they're all gases. Um, partial pressure can be used as a concentration, which I'll talk about in a minute. But anyway, notice there's no ammonia starting, and you've got a little bit of nitrogen, and you've got a little bit of hydrogen. The little bits of nitrogen and hydrogen will react to form ammonia, and so you see over time that the partial pressure of ammonia goes up as hydrogen goes down, nitrogen goes down. Notice the slope of hydrogen is a lot steeper than the slope of nitrogen. If you look back at the equation, hydrogen is going away three times as fast as the nitrogen. Check it. This slope, I bet if we were to you know, figure out what the slope is, this hydrogen would be three times steeper than this nitrogen right here. 
and that is because of the coefficients in the reaction. So do you remember how like the rate laws and the rate constants that we were studying in kinetics, the coefficients had nothing to do with the overall rate expression except for maybe, do you remember this like, hold on. Let's pretend like we're doing the rate laws for, let's see, nitrogen N2 plus 3H2 yields 2 NH3s. So if we were to do the rate laws, so that was kind of a review. Now if you look, this slope right here should be approximately three times the steepness of this slope. And you'll notice that now that I've drawn lines on it, it kind of looks like it's that's what's happening. All right, so I just wanted to remind you that kinetics is not going away. Equilibrium is definitely um, tied directly into um, kinetics. So Now notice here on the second part. In the second part, it looks like you don't have any hydrogen or nitrogen gas at all. All you have is ammonia. And ammonia will naturally decompose until it reaches a certain limit where hydrogen and nitrogen are in perfect balance with this, nit with this ammonia. And notice something interesting. From graph 1 to graph 2, did you notice something? The concentrations, or I mean the partial pressures, are the same. Like if I were to draw like a straight line across. Look at that. That's why people like to study the Haber process because you will always at the end establish a perfect balance with these three compounds. No matter how you start it, you will end it the same way because it will establish an equilibrium at a certain point. That's why people like to talk about this um, process. Let's go back. Okay, just FYI on this whole Haber process. It's fascinating. It says, the rate needed to grow food here in the United States and all over the world, um, it, um, it's the, the need for the food is higher than we can actually make the food naturally by Mother Nature. And remember, we need nitrogen in the soil in order to grow decent crops. If you don't have nitrogen in the soil, then you will have poor crops being, being formed. And that's why a lot of people, when they when they have a farm or something, they don't produce a crop every year. They usually produce a crop every other year. They give it one year to kind of naturally infuse nitrogen from the atmosphere down back into the soil. If you don't allow for that process, you're not going to get a very good crop. You could even um, instigate certain types of diseases to form into your crop. So um, the harbor process was awesome because it allowed us to synthesize ammonia or nitrogen. So once we were able to make fertilizers with nitrogen, instead of doing a crop every other year, you could use artificial fertilizers to start producing crops every year. It says larger and larger quantities of fertilizers are needed to keep up with human demand. So Fitz Harbor, that's the guy's name, Fitz Harbor, um, his research developed a way to produce ammonia for German war, for the German war effort in 1913, it says nitrogen manufacturing figured heavily into explosives manufacturing, and it says that in 1986 alone, which is you know much later, we produced 14 million tons of ammonia in just the United States alone. So ammonia is very important for crops. Looks like it was really important for the German war effort in 1913. So that's why a lot of people like to talk about the Haber process. Let's get back to equilibriums a little bit. All right, for this general formula, you've got um, A, B, P, and Q. Don't get too wrapped up on the whole uh, what stands for what, but basically the small letters stand for the coefficients. Okay, so we've got coefficients here that we have to worry about. Equilibrium constant Equilibrium constants will help you determine where the reaction will stop, basically. So an equilibrium constant is where all of the, um, where the forward process equals the backwards process. And sometimes people symbolize Kc, the equilibrium constant, as K-equilibrium, K-E-Q. I'm more familiar with the K-E-Q. Naturally, your book loves to see K sub C. Um, it's the same thing. 
right? K sub C is the same as K equilibrium. All right, so it looks like the equilibrium constant is only dependent upon the coefficients that you use on the problem. Even if you don't know the reaction mechanism, like if it's first order, second order, third order, well, not really third order, but first or second order, um, the K equilibrium still only depends upon the coefficients that you use in the problem, which is pretty cool to remember. So we no longer have to worry about the data of the rate and how much is going away and when it's going away and all that stuff, which is kind of cool. Equilibriums are fun. All right, it says um, magnitude of the equilibrium constant. So let's talk about what that constant really means. The equilibrium constant really is just a ratio of the reactants to the products. Did you notice that? Look back. You put your products on the top, you put your reactants on the bottom. So products on top, reactants on the bottom. It says, therefore, if you have a large K value, that means that more products were produced at equilibrium. And if you have a really small value of K, that means that the more reactants were, were present at equilibrium. So it says, if K is a lot bigger than one, then your products are dominating your equilibrium. And that usually means that it's a spontaneous reaction favoring your products. Now, the same would be, the opposite would be true for a really low value of K. If you've got extremely low values of K, then the opposite is true. Then your um, reactants would be favored extremely. And so it would be non-spontaneous if K is really small, okay? So keep that in mind. Here we go. All right, it says when the reactants of products are gases, we can change the K equilibrium, you know, the KEQ or the KC, can look a little bit different. So I don't want you to get confused. KEQ is equal to KC. Now, when we talk about gases instead of like, um, you know, precipitates or solutions, then we need to be using this, partial pressures. Partial pressures are kind of equivalent to molarity and stoichiometry and stuff like that. So if you're using pressures, um, you're using gases, and gases can be considered the same. So it's pretty easy. All right, it says, FYI, you can use the ideal gas law to convert between partial pressures and the concentration in molarity. Now, this is really cool because if you have a gas that's dissolved in solution, it's, it, this is pretty spiffy. All right, so hold on. It says um, partial pressure of any gas is equal to the concentration of that gas times RT. Do you guys remember the ideal gas law constant, where it came from? It came from the combined gas law. And if you remember, it was something like this, P1, V1 over T1, N1 is equal to R. And if you rearrange the formula, you would get PV is equal to NRT. That's a combined gas law. So it says that the partial pressure of any gas is equal to, you see that molarity? This is molarity, times RT. That's really where partial pressure is stemmed from. It says you can also convert between K um, equilibrium and partial pressure. This is a really important formula to remember right here. Notice that this is partial pressure, this is concentration, and all they did is they added a little bit of RT. And then you see this, delta N, change in the number of moles. It says delta N is the change in the number of moles of gas in the chemical equation for the reaction. It equals the sum of the coefficients of the gaseous products minus the sum of the coefficients of the gaseous reactants. So make sure that you are doing the products minus the reactants. And delta N is really easy to use if you're just looking at a balanced equation. If you've got your balanced equation, delta N, just look at your products minus the reactants. Okay, so finally, some examples, all right? It says an equilibrium can be approached from any direction. So you can talk about the products going to the reactants or the reactants going to the products. For example, the way that we wrote this from left to right, we would have to put the products on top and the reactants on the bottom. Notice I raised the concentration of the products to a two because there's a coefficient of two at the top. So for this particular example, 
this, if I were to say that this was equal to 0.212 at 100 degrees Celsius, that would be like a value that I would give you. I'm not like giving you any information here. This is just an example. What if I attack it and switch the equation to be backwards? What if I made it look like this? Now it looks opposite from the problem that I just gave you before. It would be still products over reactants. So this time I would put the products on top, the reactants on the bottom, the reactants are, have to be raised to the second power, I would make this 1 over 0.212. So if you know one of them, right, if you have one, you should be able to figure out the other one. My next question would be, who's favored in this particular problem? Do you remember how I talked about the value of k sub c? This particular value isn't like hugely favoring one, I'm sorry, hold on. This value is not like, you know, in the thousands or, you know, tens of thousands, but it is larger than one. So according to this particular value, who is favored? Was it the way we wrote it? Look at the way we wrote it. Was this number greater or was this number greater? In other words, if I were to ask you which direction is favored. This one, like reaction, we'll call this reaction two since it was the second one you saw. Let's compare that to what we saw in the previous slide. N2O4 going to 2NO2. Which reaction is favored, reaction one or reaction two, according to the value of your K equilibrium? I'm going to leave that for you to figure out. All right, and then finally we get into the fifth section. Don't worry, I'm going to do some sample problems at the end here. The fifth section just wants you to know the difference between a heterogeneous and a homogeneous equilibrium. It says when all reactants and products are in one phase, the equilibrium is considered to be homogeneous. But then it says if one or more reactants is produced are in different phases, so like a solid and a gas or a liquid and gas, then the equilibrium is considered to be heterogeneous. And that is basically all you needed to know about the section five on chapter 15. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to proceed to go through a couple examples with you. So check this out. Go over to page, let me find it, page 632 please. On page 632, there's an example sitting here. It says example exercise 15.1. It says write the equilibrium expression k sub c for the following reactions. And you have three different examples. For the first one, that's ozone. Ozone will naturally decompose into oxygen gas. Sorry, my, co my pen is a little funky here. So if we were to do the um, K equilibrium for this guy, remember what I said, it's always products over reactants. And these coefficients do make a difference. So for this guy, we're going to put concentration of O2 on the numerator raised to the third power over the coefficient of ozone Remember, don't forget the coefficient. And there you go. There's your first one. All right, for B, the reaction looks like this. Two NO gas, nitrogen monoxide, plus some chlorine gas. Notice the arrows going in both directions. I'm not sure I know the name of that gas. All right, so K equilibrium. Remember, it's always products. Just a second, hold on. Let's see, control, shift, F. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so for this guy, you would attack it the same way you did in the previous problem. Just be mindful of your coefficients for your equilibrium constants. So this will be NOCl 
raised to the second power over NO raised to the second power times chlorine. And chlorine doesn't have a coefficient, so we're going to leave it as 1. Okay, for the last one, you have, ooh, you got a silver ion. So you got an ion in solution. AQ plus ammonia in solution will naturally decompose into silver ammonia ions. It's a complex ion. All right. So, pretty funky looking equation here, but it's still tackled from the same way that we did the last one. So you're going to put your products on the numerator. Complex ion. And we're going to put our silver ion. There's no coefficient on that silver ion, but there is on this guy, on the ammonia. So I raise it to the second power. There you go. Pretty darn easy, right? Are you guys feeling pretty comfortable here? All right, so I'm going to ask you another quick question. What is the difference between this and this? Well, this is also equal to K equilibrium, and these are for, um, which I'm going to show you how to do this later, but this is for solids, liquids, oops, and aqueous solutions. This is special just for gases. Okay, and I'll show you how to get the concentration of a solid, the concentration of a liquid, and an aqueous solution. It's really not that hard. But for a gas, did you remember what I showed you at the end? How to figure out um, the concentrations based off of some of that KP stuff? So hold on, let me show you. Go to the top of page 634. At the top of page 634, it's talking about how you can get some various um, different values from your K sub P. So if you were trying to find the um, molarity of like K sub P and stuff like that, you can actually use K sub P to figure out the molarity of your gases, which is pretty cool. So for us, this is what I need you to try to remember. The partial pressure of any gas, we're going to call the gas A, all right? This is going to be equal to, in your book it says, NA over VRT. Now doesn't that look really confusing? Concentration A times RT. All right, where did they get, how did they get this to turn into molarity? Basically, guys, all this is, this expression right here is the number of moles per unit of volume, per liter. And N, that's what N is, is number of moles. V is the total volume of the gas that the gas occupies. That's how they got molarity. Okay? That's all I need you guys to try to remember. And remember that PV is equal to NRT. So if you look at N, that's where N is. If you look at V, that's where V is. Look at what you did. All you did is you divided by V on both sides. V cancels, and so look at what you got. Partial pressure is equal to exactly what I just told you. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that you saw the math on that one. And then one more important part. This is also on page 634. The equilibrium constant when you have partial pressures therefore would be equal to the equilibrium constant regular for like solution solids times if you have gases present RT multiplied by the change in N so I'm going to give you guys a quick example let's pretend that you have this gas do you remember the example that I kept giving you at the beginning this guy is colorless he will naturally decompose into nitrogen dioxide, which is brown. If you had to figure out delta N
for this particular example. Do you know how to do it? You look at the coefficients on the products and you compare it to the coefficients on the reactants. Delta N for this particular process would be 2 minus 1, which is to the first power. Okay, so if you were given this this equation as an example to try to solve for um, uh, any of these other values, in fact you could really solve for anything you wanted to. Um, you could solve even for temperature, which is really bizarre. If you had all the other values, you could solve for temperature. And remember that R is really easy. R is just your regular gas law constant. So it's usually uh, 0 0.0821. So let me give you the example that you see here. Example exercise 15.2 is on page um, 634. We're going to kind of look at this one real quick before we stop. It says, in the synthesis of ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen, so this is the example that I was giving you, and these are gases, notice. So it's good that we're getting this example as gas. Forms ammonia. This is that special harbor process. It says K sub C, so remember that's, that's a concentration. This is equal to 9.60 at a specific temperature at 300 degrees Celsius. Be careful your temperature is in Celsius, not Kelvin. It says that they want you to calculate K sub P for this reaction at that temperature. All right, so look back at the equation one more time. It says that K sub P is equal to K sub C times R T to delta N. All right. So you've got K sub C, which is 9.60 R. Be careful of your R. Just remember that this is um, these are all um, SI units. So you want to use the SI term for your gas law constant. So this would be 0 0.0821. Hold on, I want to do the quantity. I don't want to close my parentheses yet. Temperature needs to be in degrees Celsius, so let's make sure we do that. So plus 273, so that would be um, 573 Kelvin. Okay. Delta N, that would be the products minus the reactants. So your products here is 2 minus your reactants is 4. Look at this one. You have a negative 2 on that coefficient right there. Pretty wicked cool, huh? All right, here is all of your crazy math. Have fun. Oh, one more thing on the math on this guy. I want you to realize that anytime you have something raised to a negative power, what that technically means is it's on a denominator. Well, it's relative, but basically this would be the same as saying like your your book did it like this. So I just wanted to show you that anytime you have a negative power that this is what they're really doing. 8 2 1 times 573 but you gotta make sure that whatever the negative is like whatever the negative number is that you're still remembering to put that number back right there as a positive. So that I just wanted to show you where that came from. But your calculator should be able to handle this just as long as you are careful about your quantities. If you type this all in parentheses, your calculator should have no problem doing this at all. It's just whether or not you can push it in correctly. So your K sub P should be 4.34 times 10 to the negative 3. All right. One of the things that the AP questions like to do, though, is have you solved for, like, T? which is really interesting, what temperature is it, because they'll give you both of these values. So just be aware that sometimes um, you may have to solve for that T value. I want you guys to make sure that you are doing your lecture first by yourself, I mean the outline first by yourself, and that you're listening to these and doing the small little um, guided outline second. So again, outline first, this second.